going to be talking about blood. We'll start with the functions of blood. So we know that blood is a life-sustaining transport vehicle for the cardiovascular system. What do we mean by when we say cardiovascular system? What's all included in the cardiovascular system? The heart. Yep, the heart. So cardio for heart. Yep, what else? Our veins and arteries. Yeah, your blood vessels. So that's why blood plays a, a integral role in that because it allows for the movement, of, kind of like the highway, um, the movement of substances between the heart and then the highway, just the blood vessels to certain organs. Okay. So three main functions of blood include transport, and that's the one we talked about earlier, regulation, as well as protection. So in terms of transporting, it helps to deliver several things. And of course, <clears throat> the gases are a major one. Not only is it going to be moving O2, but what else will it be moving? CO2. Yeah. Okay, and it's going to be moving the nutrients around as well. Okay, It's also going to transport metabolic waste. Okay, It's going to transport to two main areas the lungs, as well as the kidneys for it to be eliminated. It's going to transport hormones, okay, from and to endocrine organs to their target glands, okay, or target organs. Um, so that's one of the main reasons, one of the main differences between endocrine and exocrine, right? Because endocrine always has to travel through, through the blood, and that's why endocrine produces hormones, okay? Questions so far? Okay. In terms of regulation, regulation helps to maintain body temperature. Blood will also help to maintain pH by using buffers. And it will also help to regulate food volumes. Okay, and we'll talk about how as we progress through and what particular element or portion component of blood does that. Okay, lastly, it provides protection. In terms of protection, it's going to help to prevent blood loss. Okay, in order to do that, they have particular plasma proteins as well as platelets that function in clot formation, and we're going to go through that um, particularly with the platelets and the particular plasma proteins, okay? It's also going to prevent infection in terms of a couple different ways. One, through antibodies, as well as through complement proteins and white blood cells, okay? So three ways in which blood provide protection against infection through antibodies, through complement proteins, and through white blood cells. All right, so let's take a look at um, this picture right here. So this picture is a, it's a picture of a hematocrit. So you draw the blood, you put it into a tube, and then you centrifuge it. And when you centrifuge it, centrifuge it, um, it's going to separate the components of blood based on what? And the density. Absolutely. It's going to separate based on density. which is why the most dense goes to the bottom and the least dense is going to go to the top. So you can see that there are three main components of the, that's separated in a hematocrit, okay? So you have plasma is the lightest, because it's the fluid component. It makes up about 55% of blood. It's the least dense, and that's why it's in the top, okay? Then in the middle, you have the buffy coat, this kind of yellowish white stuff right here, very little. In the buffy coat, it's gonna consist of the leukocytes and platelets. It makes about less than 1% of blood. Why do you think it's the least abundant?
Why would you want the Buffy coat to be the least abundant? Is it so that it can move more, like, throughout the blood? That's a good guess. Keep going. Is it because of the platelets? Okay. So, what about the platelets? That's what clots your blood. Yeah, and do you normally want your blood to be clotted? No. You don't. Okay. Same for leukocytes. So leukocytes and platelets are things that increase in number as a sign of infection or of bleeding, right? So in a healthy person, you would only want less than 1% of the leukocytes and the platelets, okay? And if you have an infection, that's when, that's, you know, how you would determine it if you have an infection is if the buffy coat components are increased. Make sense? Yep. Then the second most com most abundant and also the most dense component is, are the erythrocytes. The erythrocytes are also known as red blood cells, just like the leukocytes are also known as white blood cells. Okay, so erythrocytes make up forty five percent of the whole blood, and it is the most dense, and that's why it's on the bottom. So you can find the components of blood divided in a couple of ways. You can find it divided by first the, the fluid versus the solid components. And by solid, we mean formed elements. Okay. So in terms of fluid, what would you put in here? What would fall under fluids? Plasma. Yeah. And then what would fall under solids? The buffy coat and erythrocytes. Okay, so we have the white blood cells. We have the platelets. We have the red blood cells. Yeah. Questions on that classification? All right. So blood is the only fluid tissue in the body. That's important to note. It is a tissue, okay, but it's a fluid tissue. Okay. It consists, it is a type of connective tissue to be specific. Do you remember when you learned about connective tissue, you, you learned about adipose, bone, blood, and so on. So of all the connective tissue, blood is a tissue and it's the only one that's fluid. So being a connective tissue, all connective tissue have two things in common. It's got some type of cell and it's got some type of matrix, okay? So the matrix that you would find in blood would be plasma. So plasma is the matrix or the ground substance that you would find in the connective tissue called blood. The types of cells that you find here form the formed elements, okay? And they include erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. In terms of characteristics and volume of blood, blood tends to be an oblique fluid, so kind of like um, white, not clear, but white, okay? And if you've ever accidentally bit your lip and tasted a little bit of the blood, it has a metallic taste to it. Why do you think it has a metallic taste to it? Well, we'll find out. And I'll ask you this question again at the end if I don't remind me, and you should have the answer by then. Okay. All right. So in terms of the color of blood, it depends on the oxygen content. Okay. 
if it has high levels of oxygen, it's going to be more of a bright red or scarlet red. And if it has low levels of oxygen, it tends to be a darker mercury red. Okay. And that's why oftentimes you can determine whether, um, like if someone had internal bleeding, you can look at the blood. If it's a dark red, that means that, that this event, the bleeding occurred a while ago. And if it's a more bright scarlet red, that means it's a current bleed. Okay. And that's why it's nice to know the difference. In terms of blood, of pH, blood tends to be a little bit what? Who remembers what these, these values represent? Um, blood would be a little bit basic. Excellent. Okay. So seven is neutral. Anything above seven would be basic. So slightly basic. And, and look at the range. The normal range for blood is 7.35 and 7.45. So is that a wide range or a narrow range? Would you classify that as a wide or narrow range? Fifty fifty, make a guess. Why? It's actually narrow range. Okay. So you your blood has your blood pH has to be between 0.35 to 0.45. So that's a, a 0.10 difference. Okay. And the importance of that is that if it falls below 7.5. Or above 7.3, I'm sorry, if it falls below 7.35 and it falls, if it goes above 7.45, that's dangerous. Okay, because that means that your blood is e either acidic or too basic. Okay, so the range is actually pretty narrow. Okay, and that means that certain areas of your body is more sensitive than others. So if your blood pH changes to either below or above that, that can damage, let's say, you know, brain tissue, other tissues within your body, okay? All right, so blood makes up about 8% of your body weight. On average, it's a little different for males versus females. And this again is just based on body mass overall. So females, because females tend to have um, a lesser body mass, the average volume is four to five liters. Males have about five to six liters. And again, it's not always gonna be true. It's just based on average body weights, okay? All right, so we're gonna talk more about the plasma now, the blood plasma specifically. We're gonna go through and talk about all the elements. So we'll start with plasma, and then we'll go into white blood, red blood cells, white blood cells, and then platelets, okay? So starting with blood plasma. Blood plasma has kind of a straw-colored sticky fluid, so think of it like kind of like yellowish. And it is mostly water, okay? It is mostly water, 90% water. It does also contain solutes, because remember, what's plasma as the fluid in blood helps it move things along, right? So as it's moving things along, it's gonna contain solutes that it's moving around, which include nutrients, the gases, the hormones, the waste, the proteins, and the inorganic ions, okay? That's the majority of the solutes, okay? The other solutes, and these you wanna make sure you know, and there's a long list of them, but I'm only gonna require you to know three. So the three most abundant amongst the plasma proteins, okay, are albumin, globulin, and fibrin. Okay, if you've ever had known someone or worked with someone that had to have um, dialysis, for example, okay, so if they have dialysis, sometimes when they're cleaning out the blood, they tend, they can draw too much albumin out, and that causes the blood 
viscosity and osmolarity to change. And that's why they have to give the, that patient back a dose of the albumin. Okay, so albumin is important because it deals with viscosity of blood and osmolarity. What's viscosity mean? Is it the thickness? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. So the plasma protein albumin can either draw water in or cause water to go out. So it it determines the thickness of blood. And that's that of course then goes hand in hand with osm with osmolarity. What's osmolarity? Osmolarity is like um, ions trans transporting through water. That's exactly it. Okay, so albumin is important because it controls the how thick blood is, as well as how much water plays a role in transporting the, um, the ions. Okay, globulins. Globulins are a little trickier because these globulins, there are three main types. There's alpha and beta. A, that's alpha and then beta. Okay, so alpha and beta are transporting globulins. Okay, but it also has gamma globulins. And gamma globulins, you can think of those as antibodies. So oftentimes on a test, when I ask students, uh, true or false, antibodies are cells that allow for protection. What do you say? True or false? Antibodies true. are cells that allow for protection. I'm sorry, I missed that. True. That's what most of them say. Absolutely. But let's listen to the question again. Antibodies are cells that allow for protection. Would it be false because, um, like, instead of cells, um, they, like, wouldn't just be considered, like, cells? Correct. What would they be considered as? Proteins. Yes, that's exactly it. So that helps to demystify a major concept. Antibodies are not cells. They're proteins. Okay. And there are lots of different types of antibodies, but gamma antibodies are globulins, and globulins are plasma proteins. And that's why it makes sense that antibodies are found where? Particularly gamma antibodies. Where are they found? in plasma, in blood, right? Okay, so that's albumin and that's globulin. Then you have fibrin. Now fibrin actually has an initial form called fibrinogen. Okay, so that's the initial form. So fibrin's initial form is fibrinogen. Anytime you see the word ogen right here, anytime you see the word ogen, it means it's in the inactive form. So if I were to take a sample of my blood right now and look at the plasma proteins, which form should I have, fibrin or fibrinogen? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Absolutely. So if I were to draw some of my blood right now and look at the plasma proteins, 
So I did a blood smear. And I'm, I'm looking at my plasma proteins. What form would I find in my blood? Would I find fibrinogen or fibrin? Fibrin. Okay. Why? Um, I think because at that point, like, it would be active. Why would you want it to be active? I like your, th your thought process. Keep going. I think so that, um, because I know about, like, proteins, you would want it to be active so that it could, like, perform its tasks. Um, okay. That's a great point. I, I don't really know what else to say. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's, that's a great point. So that means we have to look at what the task of fibrin is. So fibrin, as a plasma protein, what does it do? Has anyone heard of it before? I mean, I don't expect you to because that's why you're taking this class, but I know that a lot of you have really strong prior knowledge. So fibrin is the plasma protein responsible for blood clotting. Do you remember how in this earlier slide right here? Right here, we said that one of the functions of blood is protection and it protects against infection and I'm sorry, it it protects by preventing blood loss. And it's the plasma proteins that prevent blood loss. So now you know which plasma protein, which one? Fibrin. Yes. So let me go back to that question. Okay. If I'm sitting here and I'm not bleeding out, I don't have any trauma, I don't have anything that, that would cause me to be losing blood, what form would I find in my blood? Fibrin or fibrinogen? Fibrinogen? Yes. Okay. So the majority of the time, you will find the plasma protein in its form fibrinogen, which is excellent because blood clotting is what? And you learn this in like chapter two with Gene. So blood clotting, is that a positive feedback or a negative feedback? Positive? Yes. Excellent. So blood clotting is a positive feedback. And that means it's an self-amplifying, but it can be dangerous, right? You don't normally want to have blood clotting help happening in your blood. And that's why it's in the form of fibrinogen. You want it to be inactive until you have a cut. Okay? So those are the three proteins that I'm asking you to know. Albumin, globulin, and fibrin. And I want you to know, I may ask questions about them more specifically. Like, for example, which of the following would are forms of antibodies? And I'll say albumin, alpha, and beta globulins, gamma globulins, and fibrinogen. What would you say? Globulins. Specifically, which one? Gamma. Yes. Perfect. All right. So here's, here's a list that details things a little bit more. You can see that we talked about the water, we talked about the solutes, okay, and the things that you'd find in solutes, of course, would be the electrolytes, and then you'll have, and the, and you also find things like nutrients, oops, right, sorry, it's right here, nutrients, um, the gases, as well as the hormones, and then we also went through the three main plasma proteins that you should know. Okay, which are albumin, globulin, alpha, beta, as well as gamma, and then fibrinogen. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this. So we're done with plasma, and now I'm going to move on to red blood cells or erythrocytes. What do you notice about erythrocytes? 
what key words would you use to summarize what what uh, of your observations of a red blood cell? Let's start with shape. What shape would you say it is? Discoid. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like a disc, definitely. Looks like a donut, right? So you notice that it dips down here and it dips here. So because of that, we call that, you're right, we'll, let's put what you said first is discoid, but it's also biconcave. Okay, so it dips down here and down here. What do you normally find in the center of a red blood cell? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What do you normally find in the center of a, of a cell? Not a red blood cell, but of a cell. A nucleus? Yeah. So what that tells you is that erythrocytes are what? Because it's hollow. Be brave, make a guess. It's best to be wrong now. And actually studies show that if you are wrong now, you're more likely to be right on the test. So if it's biconcave, it's hollow in the middle, and normally you find a nucleus in the middle, that means red blood cells don't have what? A nucleus. That's right. And what, do you, what did you learn about nucleus? Why is the nucleus important? Um, mitosis occurs in the nucleus. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Mitosis, and that means growth, repairing, right? So producing proteins that help you repair. So because it has no nucleus, it doesn't repair. And has a red blood cell moves in and out of blood vessels, okay, it's going to wear and tear which explains why on average, a red blood cell can live for how many days? So because it doesn't repair, on average, it lives for about only 120 days. Oh no, does that mean we only can live for 120 days? No. No, why? Um, Because we're constantly producing new red blood cells. Exactly. Okay, so keep that in mind when we go through the life cycle of a red blood cell, okay? So you know it doesn't have a nucleus. That explains why it only survives for about 120 days, okay? Another thing it doesn't have is it doesn't have a mitochondria. What does mitochondria do? Produces ATP. Yes, ma'am. How does it produce ATP? Cellular respiration? Yes. You said a magical word. Respiration. Requires what? Oxygen. Yes. What's the purpose of a red blood cell? Is it to transport oxygen? Exactly. So do you want it to use up the oxygen that it's transporting? You don't, right? And that's why a red blood cell does not have mitochondria. Okay, and if it doesn't have mitochondria, that means what form of respiration does not occur in a, red, in a mature red blood cell? Aerobic. That's right. So a red blood cell is the only cell in your body that re relies only 
on anaerobic respiration. Okay, because there's no mitochondria. It makes sense because if mitochondria was there, it would be using up the oxygen it's supposed to be carrying, not using. Okay, all right. So that's just some of our pre, you know, our preliminary um, observations of it. So you can see that erythrocytes are small. They're about 7.5 micrometers. Um, they contribute to gas transport. That's the O2 and the CO2. They're biconcave, okay? And a nucleate, meaning no nucleus. And they essentially have no organelles, okay? What's important is that their functional unit, okay? So the functional unit of a red blood cell, meaning what, so we know that the function of a red blood cell, what does it all? So the functional, <clears throat> excuse me, the functional unit of a red blood cell are hemoglobin, abbreviate HB for short, okay? And that's what we're gonna be talking a little bit further about. We know that red blood cell diameters are larger than some capillaries, which is why, you know, they have to squeeze in and squeeze out. Okay. All right. So what characteristics makes it efficient for red blood cells to carry gas? We talked a little bit about, right? One, the fact that it's biconcave. Lots more surface. Okay. That allows for the gas exchange. Two, hemoglobin makes up 97% of the cell volume. Okay, so it's all hemoglobin. So in a red blood cell, it's all hemoglobin. Well, not all, but 97%. Okay. And we just talked about this, right? Red blood cells don't have mitochondria. So then how does it survive? It's the only in your body, cell in your body that re relies purely on anaerobic respiration. So they don't consume the oxygen they're supposed to transport. Okay. So... Let's do another observation. What do you notice here? So that we're looking at the structure of a hemoglobin. What do you notice in the hemoglobin? What is this picture representing? Did you ask what this picture is representing? Yep. It looks like a, uh, what makes a hemoglobin a hemoglobin with the heme groups that, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. That's a good start. So you can see that there's these pinwheel looking structures. It doesn't quite look like pinwheels in there, but it, it actually really does look a lot like pinwheels. So how many heme groups are there? Four. Yep. If each heme group can carry on to one molecule of oxygen, how many molecules of oxygen can one hemoglobin carry? Four. Four. Yeah. Now, it's technically not the heme group that's really carrying it because the heme is bounded to this structure right here. And it's this structure right here that has a high affinity or likes to bind to oxygen. What is that? So let me give you an example. We don't have too much of it anymore, but we used to make cars out of metal, okay? And if you, the car gets older, it gets rusty. And that's because what that metal is made up of has a high affinity for oxygen and produces rust. What's that metal called? Iron. Yeah, it's iron. So iron, just like the iron of a car, has a high affinity. Or oxygen. So that's actually what in a red blood cell is carrying the oxygen. It's the iron that you find on the heme group. So overall, we say that the heme groups carry oxygen. 
but it's really the iron that's doing that. Okay. And that's why when, particularly in females, because of a monthly cycle, females can undergo iron deficiency, which causes them to be really lethargic because there's, there's less iron available to produce hemoglobin. And if there's less hemoglobin, there's less oxygen being carried. If that less oxygen is being carried, less ATP is being produced, hence lower energy levels, okay? All right, so that's the heme group. So we covered the heme. How about the last thing? Beta globin chains. Yeah. Beta and alpha. So you got, I don't have brown on here. I'm just going to use um, gray. Okay, so you have these chains of amino acids. So they're protein in nature. And they surround the heme groups. There's four of them. Okay. So you've got the globin chains. They're two alpha and two beta, okay? So those are responsible for actually carrying what, what's left? Is it? Carbon? Yes, it is. Carbon dioxide. Okay. So the majority of oxygen is carried on hemoglobin. But there are certain small percentage of carbon dioxide that's also carried on hemoglobin, specifically on the globin chains. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. Just to make a note, because we are in Minnesota, okay, just to add a little note, I mentioned that iron binds to oxygen, right? But it binds to carbon monoxide even stronger. Okay, so the iron in the heme group binds to carbon monoxide higher than it does oxygen. What does that mean for us in the wintertime? That our cars will rust in the winter more than they would in the summer. <laughs> and that's a good one. That's a good one. But I'm I'm thinking I'm talking about like us in in terms of humans. But that's actually a very good one. That's a that's a good reply. Does it have to do with them starting their cars up in the gap in the garage? Yeah. Some older houses have furnaces that release carbon monoxide. Some cars, re cars release carbon monoxide. So like if you keep it running in a garage and you sit, or if you're the, in there, you can have what's called carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, so what's happening, carbon monoxide poisoning, whether it's in a house or some enclosed structure where there's a high production of carbon monoxide, it will bind to the iron over the oxygen, which means you'll get really tired and you'll get sleepy and you won't wake up unless you, you know, help comes on time. Okay, so that's what carbon monoxide is about. It binds because it just has a higher affinity for the iron than the oxygen does. Okay, all right. So, uh, Ripple cells are dedicated to respiratory gas transport. We kind of talked about that multiple times. Hemoglobin binds reversibly with oxygen, which means it binds, it loads and unloads, okay? So what this reversibly means, it means it can load it and unload it. Load and unload. Okay. And what particularly would bind with oxygen? Water? Nope. So what component oh, hemoglobin? Just... Wait. I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I 
You do know, you just didn't hear my question. So what component of hemoglobin binds with oxygen? Oh, the iron, the heme. Yeah. Oh, okay. You did know. Yes. Okay. So each red blood cell contains about 250 million hemoglobin molecules. So if I wanted to know exactly how many red, how many oxygen molecules bind to one red blood cell, what, how would I calculate that? What's the maximum? If I knew that there's 250 million hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell, how would I calculate what's the maximum amount of oxygen that can be carried in that one red blood cell? How would I represent that mathematically? Can you put it to the fourth power? Yep, 250 million times four. Yep. Okay, so hemoglobin consists of the heme group, we talked about that, and the globin chains. Globin chains consist of the polypeptide, that's the amino acids, or the protein, okay? The heme it gives the color, it binds to the oxygen, and each heme molecule, and specifically the heme group, can transport up to four oxygens. Okay, so that's just kind of reviewing what we talked about. Here's a term that you'll want to know, hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis. So hemato means blood, blood cells, okay? So this is the formation of all blood cells. In other words, we're looking at red blood cell, white blood cell. Can I ask a question about the last slide? Yes, ma'am. So is it... um? It's one like oxygen molecule for like each heme group for yes. one red blood cell or okay hemoglobin. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I love questions. I always ask questions. That means that you're listening. Okay. So ask questions anytime. Okay. So hematopoiesis is going to occur in the red bone marrow. And you learned that in last um the AMP1. Okay. Because if you haven't, make sure you remember like the skeleton system, okay? So you have these stem cells are the hemocytoblasts, okay, or the hemopoietic stem cells that gives rise to all of the formed elements. And that's the red blood cell, the white blood cell, and the platelets, okay? So let's look at what that looks like. So you have the hemopoietic stem cell right here. It's going to differentiate and become proerythroblast. And the proerythroblast is going to produce basophilic to pichromatic to arthrochromatic to reticular site. And then finally, you notice that it's eventually starting to lose its nucleus, which means that this right here is the pathway of what particular formed element. There's only one that loses its nucleus. You read your say? Yes, thank you. Okay. Where, let me show you another one. Oh, here we go. Okay. So here, you're seeing the hematopoietic cell right here. Depending whether it becomes a lymphoid cell or myoid cell, that's going to determine what its final stage is going to be. So you can see that from the hematopoietic cell, in addition to being, being capable of becoming a red blood cell, it can also become white blood cells that include eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, um, monocytes, B lymphocytes, and T lymphocytes. Okay, so this hematopoietic stem cell right here, okay, can become multiple different cells. So that's the, the stem cell that we talked about. Okay. 
right here. Okay. So this is one pathway. And this one pathway specifically is going to produce erythrocytes. It can do other pathways that will produce the white blood cells as well as the platelets. Okay. All right. So with red blood cells, okay, some regulation and requirements are, are needed for erythropoiesis. If you have if you don't have enough red blood cells, it's going to lead to a condition called hypoxemia or hypoxia. Okay. What's hypoxia? Not enough oxygen. Yeah. O O2. Okay. And if you have too much red blood cells, it's going to increase the blood viscosity. So blood will become too thick. That's also a problem. Okay, so too little red blood cells, you won't have enough oxygen. Too much red blood cells, your blood becomes too thick. Okay, so it's really important to have a balance between um, the red blood cell production as well as the destruction. And that depends on hormonal, hormonal controls as well as dietary requirements. Okay, on average, we make about 2 million red blood cells per second. Can you afford to give blood? Yes. Yeah. You will be absolutely fine if you donate blood because you will just increase your production and decrease your destruction. Okay, we make so much. We definitely have enough to donate blood. All right, so some dietary requirements for red blood cell production. You, of course, would need the amino acids. Why would you need the amino acids? It's a major component of what? Proteins. Yep, and what protein do you need in erythro erythrocytes? Is it the polypeptide chains? Absolutely, you got it. That's why you need the amino acids to make the polypeptide chains that become the globin chains. Okay, and of course you also need some lipids and carbohydrates. Why do you need iron? So the oxygen has something to bind to. That's right. Iron is needed to form the hemoglobin, particularly the heme. Okay, here's a good one. Okay, oftentimes people who um, have red blood cell issue are suggested to take vitamin B12. What does vitamin B12 do? So I know it, it helps with the rapid division cells as developing red blood cells, but what, why is vitamin B12 important? Can you repeat that question? Sorry. No, that's okay. I always ask. Why is vitamin B12 important? It's what helps carry the iron so that it can become a part of the heme groups, okay? So B12 is important because it helps to shuttle the iron, same as folic acid. And folic acid is especially important during when? Pregnancy. All right, so now we'll go through the life cycle of a red blood cell, and this should all make sense. It has a lifespan of 100 to 120 days. It has no nucleus, and because it has no nucleus, it can't grow or divide, okay? And as it moves in and out of the blood vessels, it becomes fragile, and it, be it starts to break down, okay? And when it is ready to be broken down, you have macrophages in the spleen, there's also some in the liver that will help break down the dying red blood cells, okay? 
So there's there's a textbook that I used to read, and they're like, the spleen is the graveyard of red blood cells. Sounds super cool. But anyways, okay. So the red blood cell broken down goes through some processes, okay? So first you have to break the red blood blood cells down to the individual hemoglobin. And then the hemoglobin is broken down into the heme. Okay. And then the heme is broken down further into the iron and the pigment. And then the hemoglobin, besides the heme, will also break down to the globin chains. Okay. And the globin chains are made up of amino acids. So they'll break down into amino acids. And then the amino acids are reused. Okay. So the iron is going to be reused. The heme, particularly the pigment in the heme, okay, is broken down and becomes bilirubin. Okay. The bilirubin eventually will go to the liver, and the liver will break it down further into, uh, into urobilinogen. Okay. And eventually that leaves in the form of feces. That's what color is feces. Okay. So let's do some applicable, applicable thinking here. So when babies are born, sometimes their liver is not active yet. So when their liver is not active yet, the red blood cell is still going to be broken down because it only lasts for about 120 days. But the liver is not active. So the liver takes the bilirubin but can't break it down further into urobilinogen. So what happens? What it condition can that other lead? organ? Oh, what is jaundice. It? Jaundice, exactly. And what's jaundice? Um, I know it's when they turn yellow. <laughs> that's right, yellow. It's a color, right? And that's because the bilirubin is becomes yellow. So once the heme is broken down to bilirubin it becomes this yellow pigment. So that yellow pigment can't be processed by the liver. So it, it goes and stains the skin as well as the, the corneas of eyes. And it causes this yellow, yellow appearance. Okay. The globin, like I said earlier, the globin is going to be broken down to amino acids and the amino acids is just going to be reused. Okay. So that's the life cycle. So here's a whole picture of all the steps. We'll go through one at a time. Okay. So here um, you can have production of the red blood cells because it's, oh, what maintains red blood cell production, by the way? What process controls the red blood cell production? So if your bias senses that there's not enough oxygen, it responds by causing more red blood cells to be produced. Well, what process is that where you sense a change and you do something to oppose that change? Homeostasis. Homeostasis. Yay! That's the magic word I was looking for. Homeostasis. So life cycle of red blood cells maintained through homeostasis, specifically negative feedback, okay? So when there's low oxygen levels, and that's the purpose of red blood cells, right? Is to deliver, deliver the oxygen, which means that most likely the, the red blood cells aren't working. So the body is going to stimulate the kidney, and it's not just the kidney, but it's also the liver. I'm not sure why this book keeps leaving, leaving the liver out. Um, so... The book stimulates the kidneys and the liver to produce a substance called erythropoietin. And we we call it EPO for short. Okay. And then the erythropoietin rises. And when the erythropoietin level rises, it goes to the bone marrow, okay, to stimulate red blood cell production. Then new red blood cells are produced. And when new red blood cells are produced, what would the effect of that be? What would you expect to, to see? Yeah. 
what would you expect to see? Increase or decrease oxygen levels? Increased? Increased. Yes. You would see increase O2 levels because now you have more red blood cells to be carrying them. Okay. So then once they're produced, they're going to circulate through the body for about 120 days. And as they're circulating through the body for about 120 days, they get fragile and they break down. And this is the breakdown process. So the hemoglobin is broken down to the heme group and to the globin chains. The globin chains is broken down further to amino acids and they're just reused, put back into the bloodstream and reused. The heme has two parts. Remind me what the two parts of the heme are again. Are you talking about the iron in the heme? Yep, that is one. What's the other? Oxygen. It carries oxygen, but that's not the component of heme. It's the pigment, right? The heme itself that becomes the bilirubin. Now the iron is broken down and it can either be reused or lost. Oftentimes it's lost when there's a blood trauma or if, for example, women go through menses, okay? And the bilirubin, it's a pigment that will go to the, to the liver. The liver processes the bilirubin to the urobilirubin and then it's excreted through feces. Okay, so that's what happens when a hemoglobin breaks down. You want to make sure you know this process, okay? So uh, we went through it, but I want you to also know kind of the hypoxia or the hypoxemia. That's pretty much what we covered up here. Okay, and I wanted you to be able to relate that to homeostasis. Uh, we're going to move on because we are running short on time, and I want to make sure I cover all of um, the blood. Okay. All right. So that's kind of what we talked about earlier. So I'm going to pass by that. Pass. Here we go. This is what you need to know. So the other thing that you'll want to know is the disorders. Okay. So there are two main disorders that I want you to know associated with erythrocytes. That's anemia and polycythemia, okay? So anemia is associated with low oxygen, okay? And the sign of pro it's, a, it's the sign of the problem rather than the disease itself, okay? And if you have low oxygen levels, you tend to be fatigued. Your skin color is paler. You have dyspnea. Okay, where you can become blue and then you can have chills, okay? There are three reasons, three main classifications of reasons that can lead to anemia. And of course, blood loss through hemorrhagic anemia. In other words, bleeding, trauma or menses, so on, okay? The other reason is not enough red blood cells are being produced and that could be either an iron deficiency or the intrinsic factor that help that um, relate with B12, that produces the B12 so that it can help shuttle that iron to the heme, okay? The other reason is that too many red blood cells are being destroyed, and that could be genetic. For example, certain people um, through evolution has created red blood cells that can fight off the malaria and their rep, their Red blood cells, instead of being like a round biconcave, it's more of a sickle cell. So this structure prevents the malaria from go, um, from the plasmodium, which causes malaria, from entering into the red blood cell. But at the same time, it's going to cause the red blood cell itself to be broken down. 
And that's why we call this condition sickle cell anemia. Okay, so those are the three kind of reasons associated with um, anemia. Then we have the polycythemia. With this one, you make too much red blood cells. Now, of course, if you make too much red blood cell, you have the viscosity problem. And if it becomes too thick, blood, become, blood flow becomes slower. If blood flow becomes slower, nutrient delivery is slower, uh, white blood cell is slower, infection increases, and so on, okay? So some three main um, reasons that polycythema occurs. One of them is the vera, and that's essentially bone marrow cancer. So the bone marrow cancer causes an excessive number of red blood cells to be produced. A secondary reason is the secondary poly polycythemia, and this is caused by low O2 levels. So do you remember how earlier, normally, if you have low O2 levels right here, okay, it's going to release erythropoietin, and erythropoietin stimulates the red blood cell production in bone marrow. So in some conditions, okay, um, like high altitude, it can cause an increase in EPO production. So then that can be too much. And if it's too much beyond what you need for the oxygen levels, it can lead to polycythemia. The other reason is intentional, and it's called blood doping. Okay. So we know that normally you can increase EPO production in the body if there's low oxygen levels, but some people, like athletes, can also um, increase what they, they want to increase their their oxygen levels because the more oxygen you have, the more energy you have, as well as more the more ATP, right? So they would blood dope with EPO and that will cause the their um, O2 levels to increase and then that increases their stamina. There was a, um, there was a large controversial case about that with um, the bicycling, okay? Questions so far? All right. So that's it for red blood cells. We're going to move on to white blood cells. So take a look at this chart, and what do you notice about it? Um, it looks like that is the hematocrit, and the buffy coat contains the leukocytes. Yep, very good. Okay, so you're absolutely right. So this is a the formed elements component. Okay, so we did this. We would have a larger box here for plasma. Okay, so within the Buffy coat, that's less than 1%, right? And within the less than 1, which is more abundant, platelets or leukocytes? Platelets. Yeah, so platelets are the more abundant one then you have the leukocytes. So leukocytes are very little. So within the leukocytes, within the white blood cells, it's broken down into these types, okay? What's the most abundant of all the white blood cells? Which one's the most abundant? Neutrophils. Mm-hmm. Second? Lymphocytes. Mm-hmm. Third? Monocytes. Four? I don't know how to say it. <laughs> Eosinophils. And last one? The basophils. Very good. You will want to know the list of most abundant to least abundant. And a good way to remember it, and it also gives you the names, is this mnemonic? Oh, some of you may know it. Do you know the mnemonic to help you remember this? It's also a funny one. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Okay, neutrophils. Lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. 
from most abundant to least abundant. Okay. All right. Good observations. So that so this essentially just kind of goes through those observations again. So leukocytes are white blood cells, are formed elements, and they are the only ones with their nuclei as well as their organelles. Okay, because remember red, red, red blood cells don't have nuclei or organelles and platelets aren't even cells. We'll get to that when we get to platelets, okay? Although they make up only 1% of, less than 1% of the total body volume, okay? That arrow's wrong, it should be this way, okay? Functions, it, they, the white blood cells overall function in, in defense against disease, and it's gonna increase in amount in response to infection. And that's how you can tell if you have infection, okay? So if you go in the hospital, they take your blood and they say, oh, oh, your white blood cells are elevated. That means you have some type of infection, okay? So the leukocytes are categorized into two main types, the granulocytes, and the agranule sites. It's just like their names. Granule meaning it has these granules. A meaning without granule site, meaning they don't have visible granules. Anytime you see the A in front of something, it means without, okay? So granule sites meaning they have granules, agranule sites meaning they don't have granules. And that mnemonic I shared with you earlier, never let monkeys eat bananas will tell you, will list all the white blood cells from most abundant to least abundant. And if you want to remember which ones are granulocyte and which ones are A granulocytes, I use the mnemonic Benji. And you know, B, you know, like Benji the dog, you know? So basophil, eosinophil, neutrophils um, are granulated. Benji. Okay. All right. So this is an important figure you want to. Make sure you note and know, okay? So let's take a look. You can see that the first three are granule sites. Why? Describe it to me. Why are these granule sites? Because they're not like smooth looking and you can see the little granules on them. Yeah. When you say granules, what are you using to, to identify granules? For me, I'm just kind of seeing like all the little dots on them. Perfect. That's exactly it. That's what they are. So all these little dots here and here and here, those are granules. Okay. What can be a little confusing is this stain right here. Because the stain is not that great, it looks like it has granules, but it's actually smooth, just like this one right here. Okay, so only these three have true granules, the dots. Okay. Where these last two do not have the granules inside of them, even though the monocyte looks like it does, it's just a bad smear. <clears throat> so it's not supposed to, okay? All right, so the neutrophils are really interesting, okay? Look inside. What does it look like inside? What's that darker stuff inside? Are they organelles? Yes, and specifically their nucleus, okay? So you can see that the nucleus of a, of a neutrophil looks really weird. It looks like globules. And that's very characteristic of neutrophils is that they will have these multi-lobuled nucleus, okay? They tend to be red and blue due to the staining of the granules. It's not that the granules are that color. It's just that the staining produces red-blue granules. They tend to be attracted to the site of infection. So when your body has infection, okay, they are the first ones to arrive, okay? And they phagocytose bacteria. What does phagocytose mean? They engulf um, the bacteria and like 
break it up that way by like consuming it. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Where eosinophils tend to have bilobulated nucleus, so only two, they stain red. The granules stain red. These are really cool. These attack parasitic worms. Okay. However, they do play a role in allergen and asthma. So you'll see increased levels of it when um, due to the allergic response and, and asthma responses. It's really interesting because um, they found that people with higher levels of eosinophils tend to also be associated with those that have more allergic reactions as well as asthma, which makes sense. Okay, so for some reason, people with increased eosinophils are more likely to have allergies and asthma. Okay, but what particularly does eosinophils do? They attack parasitic worms. Okay. All right, then with basophils, with this one, you can see bilobule nucleus, so same. Okay, the, the nucleus is kind of, there's two lobules in there. And this one, when, it, when you stain them, they stain purple to black, okay? I do want you to note the color because in lab, you're gonna be doing a blood cell count and you're gonna be looking for how many of each type you, that you can find in a blood smear, okay? So do note um, how you would identify them. In terms of function, basophils are responsible for releasing histamines and heparin, okay? And all of those good stuff, even though they cause, you know, allergic reactions and like, like runny nose, itchy eyes, they're really important for inflammation. So basophils come to the area and they release heparin and histamines, which causes vasodilation. And that's, you know, that's what causes the, the fluid to leak out, but also for easier movement of the other white blood cells to come to the area, okay? Then you have the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are actually pretty large, okay? You can see that they're large overall, okay? Um, this is showing you a small one, but overall you can see that the, the nucleus is very large. It takes up most of the cell, okay? And when you stain it, it stains pale blue, the cytoplasm does, but there should be no granules inside. The lymphocytes are really, they're the big guns. They're very crucial to your immune system. They will differentiate into the B cells and the T cells. The B cells are what produces the majority of the antibodies. And the antibodies are proteins in structure, don't forget that. But they're really important in identifying self from non-self. The T cells will actually produce cytotoxic T cells as well as natural killer T cells. So the T cells are really important, particularly to defend you against when your cells have internal infections, like viruses that go inside your cells to hide out. None of the other white blood cells can find them except for the lymphocytes. Or parasitic things that go inside of your cells, it's the T cells that will find that and destroy them. Then you have the monocytes. Monocytes are the largest of the white blood cells, okay? They have a kidney-shaped nucleus. They tend to be pale blue cytoplasm. And again, it looks like they're granulate, but they're, they're not, okay? You, you take a look at a better staining. They differentiate into macrophages, and these are also crucial against viruses, as well as intracellular bacteria, parasites, and chronic infections, okay? All right, so if, let's say, if I gave you a case study of a patient, oh, I'm gonna wait until someone finishes going into the house. Okay, there we go. So if I gave you a case study, and this is actually a real case study, um, this person went to the hospital complaining of, you know, headache, really strong, strong headache. So they did a scan and they found that his brain was swollen, right? So what do, what do you think they thought automatically it was? When you come in with headache and your, your brain is swollen, what do you think? Make a guess. Going into the clinic? Yep. Yeah. Uh, tumor. 
tumor, definitely. What else? TBI. Yep. Traumatic brain injury. Yep. What else? I thought it was meningitis. So meningitis is caused by bacteria and virus. So viruses you really can't do much against. So if it was men bacterial meningitis, they threw antibiotics at it. Antibiotics didn't help. Brain continued to swell until finally they took they took a closer look at the blood count and they found that his eosinophils were elevated. So what happened? What was the cause of his brain swelling? Like an allergic reaction? Nope. Um, there was a parasite. Yes. This happened in Minnesota. Went swimming in a lake that had like increased levels of this type of parasitic worms, and it went up his nose, crossed the barrier into his brain, and that's what caused his his, his swelling. It was parasitic worms. So that's why it's really important to do blood counts because it can tell us a lot of what, about what's going on in our bodies. Okay, questions? If you ever watch Monsters Inside of Me, that was an episode on there. Any questions? Sorry, I didn't mean to gross you all out. In um, our lab practical is knowing what these look like um uh required i guess yes oh no 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 uh the lab practical is is more of an the anatomical structure oh, okay so yes. these would be more like on a, an exam yes like the pictures yep yep and more of the function but yes oh okay this would be more part of your lecture components yep Okay, so leukopoiesis is the production of the white blood cells, and it stimulates, same thing, it goes to the red bone marrow, right? Because they all have the same progenitor stem cell. And the two chemicals that, like with red blood cells, EPO, for white blood cells, it's interleukins and CSFs. Okay. So all leukocytes originate from the hemocytoblast stem cell, and it will differentiate into either the lymphoid stem cell or the myeloid stem cell, okay? And lymphoid stem cell will become lymphocytes, where myeloid stem cells will become all the other, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes, okay? There should be a picture in here. Um, here we go, okay? So you can see that the lymph lymphoid stem cell right here, they become lymphocytes, lymphocytes, and you have two types of lymphocytes. You have T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, okay? Where if it's the myeloid stem cell, it's going to either become the eosinophil, basophil, neutrophils, or monocytes, okay? All right. So then in terms of A granulocyte production, that's going to include the monocytes and the lymphocytes, and we just kind of walk through what they do. So monocytes, um, they can live for several months. They share a common precursor with neutrophils, that's the myoblast. And then the lymphocytes, they come from the lymphoid line, and they can either become T cells or B cells. T cells are important in that they are the ones that will um, destroy self-infected cells. And cancer. Where the B lymphocytes, they're responsible for producing um, antibodies. All right, so that's just to kind of show you their lineage. Um, in terms of hemostatic imbalance, you can have um, EPO, which causes what? To be imbalanced.
Is that red blood cells? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. And if you have imbalance in CSFs or interferons, what would it be? Actually, not interferon, interleukins, sorry. So CSFs, what would they cause an imbalance of? White blood cells? Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. So some diseases, just like we went through like diseases of the red blood cells, some diseases of the white blood cell include leukemias. And that's a common term, right? What does that mean? Blood cancer? Yes. White blood cell cancer. Okay. And infectious mononucleosis, which is caused by a virus. Okay. You can also experience leukopenia. Leukopenia refers to low white blood cell count. And oftentimes that's associated with drugs. You can take drugs that specifically lower your white blood cell count. Okay. Or it could be induced by, um, for example, glucocorticoids. Okay. So these are conditions that you would have that, uh, in, that affect the white blood cells, leukemias, infectious mononucleosis, and leukopenia. Okay. <coughs> Questions? So here's a little bit you know, going through, going into each of those a little bit more detailed. So leukemia, cancers, you have an overproduction of the white blood cells, but notice that they're abnormal. In other words, they don't work. Not functional. And that's true of most cancers is that even though they create, they cause more of those types of cells to be produced, they're abnormal. They don't do what they're supposed to be doing. Because if you think about it, if we can stimulate our body to produce normal white blood cells that function, we'd be like super immune, right? But in this case, the leukemias, they're abnormal. They do not function, okay? Um, there are two forms of leukemia. There's acute and chronic. Acute are ones that are, they, they tend, they very, they're very fast in terms of development. Um, they primarily affect children where chronic is more slower um, and it tends to be in older people. Okay, so leukemia affects both young and old. If it is occurs in young, it's very fast. So the lifespan is very, very short. In older people, depending on what stage, it could be a little bit longer or if it's later stage, it could be faster. Okay. So without treatment, all leukemias are fatal. Why do you think that might be? Is it because of the level of immuno like compromise that the person would be at? Yeah, exactly. So no immune. They're making abnormal immune cells, so there's no immunity. Our immunity works all the time. We just don't notice it. We only think about our immunity when we get sick, right? And then we recover from it. But the reason why we're not sick is not because we're not being exposed to things, but because we always are exposed to things. But your immune system is so strong that it wards it off from you ever even knowing, okay? So when people are immunocompromised, it's so dangerous that the everyday things can cause them to die could due to the infection, okay? So again, it comes back to the, the problem that the white blood cells are non-functional and they're just too much. They're taking over the, the cell lines and they can lead to anemia, bleeding. Most of the time, death is due to infection or internal hemorrhage. Okay. And it's typical cancer treatment in terms of either anti-leukemic drugs, irradiation, stem cell um, transplant. With infectious mononucleosis, it's oftentimes referred to as the kissing disease. It's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, okay? And oftentimes you will recover from this. It's you, some symptoms include tiredness, achy, chronic sore throat, low fever. 
it usually runs its course in about four to six weeks. Okay. Is that the one that's called mono? Like yeah, usually? Exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it is called mono. By the way, it is called the kissing disease or mono, but you do not have to have kissed someone to get it. Okay. So that's a very, this is a very misnomer. All right. So platelets. Um, we're going to keep it pretty basic about platelets. Platelets are not cells. Okay. So they are not cells. A lot of people think they're cells. So get this. Do you know what the old name for platelets was? We don't call that it. We don't call it that anymore. But what do we used to call platelets? How many of you heard the term the term thrombocytes? Thrombo meaning clotting, site meaning cell. They do cause clotting, but they are not cells. So we don't call them this anymore. We call them platelets because we know that they are a fragment of a larger cell called a megakaryocyte. So they have the same stem cell, the metapoietic cell, that becomes the megakaryoblast, which becomes the megakaryocyte. And then finally, it breaks the, 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 the plasma membrane breaks apart. And that's what leads to platelets. Okay. You'll want to know the steps in hemostasis. In other words, how does clotting ha happen? Okay. And it's pretty straightforward. So if you have a trauma, do you see this cut right here? So first you have to start with a trauma to the blood vessel. So the first thing that's gonna happen is that it's gonna to lead to vassal, vascular spasm. It's gonna cause it to constrict. Why do you think it causes it to constrict? So not as much blood can leave. Perfect. You're trying to decrease the amount of blood that leaves. Secondly, you're going to you're going to create the platelet plug formation. Okay, so what's going to happen is that the when there's an injury to the lining of the blood vessel, it exposes it to the collagen fibers on the surface. The collagen fibers on the surface, and that's when the platelets are going to release chemicals that make the platelets nearby become really sticky. And then that's what leads to the platelet plug until it's completely sealed. Okay, so that's essentially how trauma cuts are closed. Okay, that's only one way though. Do you remember what the other way is? So besides platelets, oh, yeah, besides platelets, what's the other way of causing blood clots? Fibrin? Yes, perfect. Very good. Okay, so we're going to end with blood transfusions. Okay, so when you have blood loss, you're going to make sure you, you, you can die from that, right? So if you lose more than 30% of your blood, it can be, you can, it can lead to shock and then you can die from it. Loss of 15 to 30% of blood will cause you to become pale as well as weak. Okay, so when you have blood loss, you need blood transfusions. And blood transfusions can be really tricky because this is the reason why. So red blood cells often have these antigens on the surface, right? So there's lots of different antigens, but the common type is A, B, O, that's the most common, and the RH factor group. Okay, so you have the ABO blood group and then you also have the RH factor blood group, okay? So let me go through here.
We're not gonna play the game quite yet. I just need to make a little insert page. And I'm gonna do some drawing. Okay. So we're gonna combine together the ABO plus the RH. Okay. So these right here, blood types, sorry, that was my really loud cat. So these blood types correspond to the antigens that you find in the surface. Okay. So here's a red blood cell. If you have A antigens on the surface, you are blood type what? A. If you have A on the surface and you have Ds, then you are A positive, okay? Where before you are A negative because you don't have that D antigen, okay? So if on the surface of a red blood cell, you have antigens, but it's neither A nor B, what would it be? Oh. Mm -hmm. And you also don't have D, so you would be O what? Negative. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, if you have antigens, but that's not A nor B, but you do have D, what blood type are you? RH. No, or O positive. Perfect. <laughs> o positive. You got it. Okay. If you have A and B, what blood type are you? A, B negative. A, B negative, very good. Then if you have A, B, and D, what blood type are you? A, B positive. Mm -hmm. Very good. And if you have just the B, what blood type are you? B negative. Mm -hmm. You have B and D. B positive. That's it. That's how you determine blood type. It's based on the ABO and the RH, which is the D. And whatever antigen you have on that red blood cell, that determines what your blood type is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have you do an activity and I'll end it early so that you have time to do this. But it's a blood typing game. Okay, it won a Nobel Prize. It's gonna help you learn why certain blood types can be transfused and why, can, and why some cannot. Okay, um, any questions before we end? I'm sorry I went a little bit over the, my promise time.